Welcome, well, everyone. Uh, I'm Anthony. I teach philosophy here at Western, and it's my job to preside over this Rotman dialogue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of the participants in it, and then I'm going to get us kicked off, and I'm also going to, along the way, moderate what I hope will be a vibrant and excellent discussion on what I believe is an absolutely excellent contribution to philosophy, public health, and public policy. All right. So our three dialoguers uh, are uh, first and foremost James Wilson, who is currently professor of philosophy and director of the Health Humanities Center at the University of College in the other London, smaller <laughs> London, where they got all the names for their streets and rivers. James works in the areas of philosophy and public policy and public health ethics and moral philosophy and political philosophy more generally. Uh, he is the author of a great many articles in a great many excellent journals, including Journal of Applied Philosophy, Journal of Medical Ethics, Public Health Ethics, and the Journal of Political Philosophy. And most especially of all, he's the author of this very fine contribution, <laughs> Philosophy for Public Health and Public Policy, subtitled Beyond the Neglected State, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Right, okay. And dialoguing with him are uh, Zoe Ritchie, who's a doctoral student here at Western in Health and Rehabilitation <laughs> Sciences program studying with our great colleague, Max Smith, over here on my right. Uh, she completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Toronto, Victoria College in Ethics, Society and Law program, and her research interests include childhood ethics, clinical ethics, legal philosophy, organizational ethics, and public health ethics. She's a graduate member of the Robin Institute of Philosophy and also the Help Lab here at Western. Last but not least, Epigen Hao is a sec third year, sorry, a PhD student here in the Department of Philosophy and also a graduate member of the Office of Philosophy. His research interests lie in research ethics, specifically in issues surrounding autonomy and trust. He's currently working on an interdisciplinary project which investigates how behavioral science could help in the recruitment of participants for medical research, in which he is part of the subproject that assesses the ethical permissibility of various ways of boosting research recruitment. So here's what we're going to do. James is going to uh, say a bit about the chapters of his book, three and four, that he's going to have us focus on. And then we'll have the question start with Zoe and then Epigen. We'll have a little bit of back and forth, I hope, as we go along. Um, feel free to um, interject at any time uh, with questions and uh, points. Just raise your hand. I'll try to make sure I see you and uh, get us going. All right, so please join me in welcoming our dialogue panelists. <laughs> So, well, just begin by thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here to be in the real London after I can, most of my life has been in the fake London. <laughs> uh, just want to say a bit more about the, the, the book over the next uh, few minutes. So that, um, just to say a little bit about the book itself. So that the point of the book is really to give a, a, a systematic overview of how, how philosophy can contribute to public health policy and, and uh, public policy more broadly. Now, part one of the book, which we're focusing on today, uh, really looks at a set of questions about the intersection between philosophy of science and the philosophy of public policy. I'm interested in a set of questions about the nature of evidence, the nature of philosophical arguments, and particularly about how insights in one context can and cannot be trans, uh, transmitted to other sorts of context. So, so it looks at questions around causation, but also normative questions about what is it that we think that we're doing, for example, when we uh, engage with a philosophical thought experiment. Um, so we aren't going to discuss them today, but just to briefly note that chapter, so part two of the book uh, aims to put forward a, a normative framework for thinking about public health. So it's interested in questions like, is, is, is public health a uh, rights issue? Uh, what about uh, paternalism and, and government health uh, policy? Uh, the, the, the final third of the book uh, aims to look at th three crucial ideas within public health in more detail, bringing together all the material about the, the, the nature of evidence and the nature of philosophy in part one of the book with the ethics framework to look in detail at 
what I think are three really important uh, questions in public policy. One about the nature of responsible, responsibility, who should be responsible for what. Uh, also about uh, when inequalities in health are, are wrong and what we should do about them. And lastly, special issues raised by communicable disease. I should briefly note, uh, it's got one of the weird things, I've been writing this book on and off for about sort of at least five years, maybe 10 years in some ways. And I basically almost finished it before COVID happened. In fact, I sent the manuscript to Oxford University Press, who then, uh, who then uh, were trying to send it out to referees, but it turned out that all the referees were actually busy doing covid -y things. So, it, so, so I sort of, would, but sort of wrote the first draft of it before COVID happened, but then I sort of, in, in some ways I was glad to have the opportunity to, to rethink it, go back and rewrite various bits of it uh, in light of some of the things that had happened with, with COVID. So on to the chapters that we're going to be discussing. So I argue in chapter three that a crucial task for normative philosophy is to make ethical decision making easier, but without falsifying or oversimplifying the nature of the choices to be made. So one of the main lessons of part one of, of the book is that philosophers have tended to think of good simplification in the wrong way. So I think we can see this by drawing out the implications of a feature of many philosophical methods that's so, in a way so obvious that, that we're, as philosophers we often don't notice it at all. So that a lot of methods that philosophers use for improving our ethical judgments rely heavily on abstraction and simplification. And I argue that these, that any such methods uh, face a double challenge of translation. Firstly, we need to be able to translate the, to locate the ethically relevant features of the, uh, the real world context, somehow sort of abstract away all the, all the chaff, get to, the, to an abstract representation of the, of the real world situation, which we do our philosophical work on. Then once we've uh, done our philosophical work on the abstract representation of the real world problem, we then need to translate that, those insights that we got from looking at the at the simplified model of the real situation back into the real world. And so the main challenge, as I, I take it, for, for practical philosophy, particularly philosophy in the context of public policy, is, well, well, well how, how do uh, ethical or political, philosophical insights uh, manage to get preserved across this double process of translation? And that one of the main arguments of chapter three is that we can learn a lot about sort of uh, the limits of, of philosophy or ways in which philosophy might be less good than we think it is by, by uh, looking at the context of experimental research, for example, clinical trials. So in both cases, both in the context of philosophical thought experiments and the context of, of clinical trials, we, need, we face two challenges uh, usually conventionally known as internal validity and external validity. So that, first of all, that the experiment we set up just might not work in its own terms. That would be a failure of internal validity. Uh, in the chapter, I discuss uh, and give a, a few examples from you know, extremely well-known and brilliant philosophers who turn out to produce some thought experiments that, that just aren't very, very well designed. Uh, they have a sort of slightly cheeky sort of reference to Francis Cam, and she has an example about a man who's, whose arms are so long he can reach from one end of India to, to the other. Uh, and he wants even to try to imagine what it was like. And you realize, well, you can't really imagine the case. And because you can't imagine it, you, re you realize that, well, how does this help our ethical thinking? So uh, the second worry would be external validity. So maybe the case is fine in and of itself, or maybe the experiment is fine in and of itself. But but it doesn't really tell us anything useful about the real world in which we're trying to make our decisions. So that I suggest that sort of thinking rigorously and elegantly about a, a toy problem doesn't necessarily imply that the results of this reflection will be useful for making wise decisions in real world context. So I think the nub of it that is that acting in an ethically responsible manner, whether it's an in individual and in or an institutional, manner requires an integrating an account of, of what our goals are, what we think is good or worth pursuing, with some causal account, i.e. out of all the things that we could do, which are most likely to bring about the results that we want. So that, to take a concrete example, uh, suppose that a, a government is, is trying to work out 
should it reduce the speed limit in built up areas, say from 30 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour. In order to decide on that question, you need to be able to think about what are the normative considerations in play. Uh, Obviously, safety might be a question, but there might also be questions about economic implications, about slowing traffic down too much. And then you need to understand well, what would be actually the effect of different sorts of regulations that we have. Somehow we need to bring together the normative and the causal. And we could think of those as, both of them as different sorts of models. Both of them are sort of abstraction simplifications that we need to bring together in decision making. So that all sorts of, of, of prediction and attempts to control the world require causal models. Some of these are, are very uh, complex. So you think about what's going on in, in climate change, where you know, an Earth system model is incredibly sophisticated. The amount of compute power it takes in order to, to run one of those is, is, is immense. But in other contexts, we may rely on sort of rules of thumb or a, a kind of much more rough and ready model, so that you might think, well, you know, I, I can allow another five people in my bioethics class without sort of degrading the quality of the teaching, but more than that, it might begin to tail off. You, you have a sort of a causal model in mind, but it's obviously you haven't run it on a, on a supercomputer. But that all causal limits, all causal models have their, their, their limits, though, because given what we know about the complexity and the interconnectedness of the, of the world, even the data that's available to a very sophisticated causal model like our Earth system model for, for climate change is going to be uh, a lot more you know, coarse-grained than the world it is that it's trying to explain and understand. So that one of the quotes I use in the book is a famous one from George Box, and he says, all models are wrong. The practical question is, how wrong do they have to be not to be useful? So a crucial question that's in the background of, of chapters three and four is how general and how ambitious it's desirable for our normal normative models to be. So as philosophers, we often debate you know, bizarre, you know, contrary to fact cases that might even be impossible as the world, in the world as we experience it. And philosophers often take it that conclusions about these kinds of quite baroque cases nonetheless might tell us something important about the normative models that we should use for decision making in the world as we find it. So on this way of thinking about it that many philosophers uh, assume is correct, if a theory has problematic or absurd implications in a situation that might never occur, this might be nonetheless be sufficient to show that the theory is incorrect. <clears throat> so many philosophers, in other words, take it that the process of normative model building should be very general indeed. We shouldn't be just trying to discover the right ethical theory for us here and now, but the right ethical theory for all, for all creatures in all possible worlds. Uh, some people like sort of uh, Jerry Cohen or Derek Parfitts take moral truth to be radically non-contingent and the discovery of moral truth to be more like, say, discovering mathematical truths. Now, obviously, it's one of the things I discuss in the book. This seems to have the rather unfortunate implication that if you think about... Uh, moral truth in that way, then philosophical de uh, debates around justice could, might become radically detached from actually anything that might help us in, in making the world as we find it more just. Of course, and this is one of my main points in the book, that it's also possible to take a much more modest approach to normative model building. If we take our cue from Box's argument that we should focus on how useful the model is rather than whether it has specific shortcomings in specific circumstances, the thought being that, well, all models, whether causal models or normative models, are going to break down in some circumstances. So if we take a more modest view about what it is that we might be doing in, in moral philosophy, we might think that, well, it might be enough if we can show that uh, uh, a normative theory is adequate for a set of cases that we, in fact, face, and it, it provides us useful advice in those sorts of contexts. And now... Depending on how, well, how ambitious we want to be about our normative models, this has significant implications for how we specify and how we test them. And if we think that what we're trying to do is to design an ethical theory which will give correct answers in all conceivable circumstances, regardless of how unlikely these circumstances are to occur, then 
It may be precisely the Baroque and the outre that may seem most salient in our theory testing. But if we think of normative models as tools that perform certain tasks well, but will be inevitably limited in other ways, we might think of theory testing more like, for example, the design of sports equipment. Just as we wouldn't think of it as a failure in a tennis racket if it wasn't very good for hitting cannonballs or pieces of couscous. So we might be relatively unworried if ethical theory would have implausible imp implications in circumstances that are very different from the ones that we in fact face. So on this more limited view of what a normative theory is for, we might want to ensure that we have a theory with, with a, you know, where the theory's sweet spot, the place where it gives us really good insights, is as large as, as possible. And that the theory is kind of useful, it's feasible to wield, like the tennis racket, but we wouldn't worry if there's some things that the theory can't do. So one of my main uh, hopes for the book is that it might persuade at least some philosophers to move away from this very sort of ambitious normative um, theorizing towards uh, a more kind of, uh, I guess, a more modest approach to, to moral theorizing, where we realize that certainly insofar as we're attempting to do the philosophy of public policy, and we're trying to produce something that could be useful for governments in circumstances relatively similar to the ones that we find ourselves to steer things in the, in the direction of justice, then maybe the more modest theory might be sufficient for those purposes, but it might actually be more rigorous of its type than, than one which uh, tests itself against intuitions in, in circumstances which are such that we know may be less likely to create external validity. So overall, uh, for these two chapters, uh, looking at chapter three allows us to uh, ask some, hopefully some searching questions about a set of philosophical assumptions about what good ethics looks like. And uh, chapter four begins a, a process of of reconstructing, suggesting that, well, if we take seriously things like complexity and, and the, the nature of the, of the social reality in which we find ourselves, then we can rebuild uh, philosophical work for public policy on uh, a more modest, but I hope more useful ground. So, so thank you. That's, that's, that's enough. very sympathetic to the, mm. the criticism that it raises to a more abstract and, and you know, theoretical thinking um, and the support for a more practice-focused approach. Um, yeah, so but I, I think it can be asked whether uh, thought experiments and uh, more abstract thinking are always used in the ways these chapters suggest and consequently whether a more charitable view of thought experiments is possible. This is what I aim to do with my questions, thinking about this. So my first question focuses on chapter three, which draws an analogy between scientific experiments and uh, thought experiments. And it can be questioned whether such a uh, such an analogy is appropriate. Uh, philosophers often do not seem to use the thought experiments in the way that scientific experiments are used. But I want to zoom in to the uh, linear model and see where it could be saved from your criticism. So, um, because even within this uh, top-down model, conclusions from the thought experiments are first tested and modified in more realistic cases. So, for example, when we're thinking about incident threats, my, any conclusion drawn from Nozick's thought experiment would be uh, would not be directly applied to public policy. First, those conclusions have to be tested uh, in a more realistic scenario um, in which someone is an innocent causal link in a threat, for example. So if the conclusions don't hold, hold up in more realistic cases, um, these conclusions have to be adjusted. Because the principles that follow from thought experiments are first tested and modified before being applied to real-world scenarios, um, it could be argued that it is less relevant whether thought experiments are extremely valid. Uh, that is, whether the conclusion of the experiment um, is applicable to various contexts uh, that do not specifically 
uh, match the control conditions of the top sphere. And so my first question is whether you think that the top-down approach where thought experiments were not intended to result in ethical principles that can be directly applied to practice would be able to avoid your uh, external validity problem? Um, I think it might do. I, mean, I think that um, part of what I attempted to do in constructing the, the linear model in, in chapter three is sometimes, I, I think it's hopefully a helpful way of doing philosophy, where you think, well, if what the people I disagree with um, uh, are correct about what they say. What else might they might they have to presuppose? How, how could their view make sense? How how could it, how could a sort of thought experiment led approach to philosophy actually end up with something that was useful for for governments? And so that uh, at that point, that's why I, th I suggest that well, well, maybe one way of doing that would be a sort of a sort of a linear approach where we say well we we can start very very abstract and then find ways of translating uh, almost sort of level by level till it becomes more. Abstract. I think that's certainly possible. I mean, I don't think. I mean, it's weird that, that philosophers probably haven't done that very much. I mean, one person I think might be a really interesting case in, in point. Someone who's done clearly the work is of, of astounding quality. Will be will be rules in a theory of justice because effectively what rules does in the theory of justice is he gives us the original position. It's quite an abstract way of des describing how to think about principles of justice. And then, as you see in, in the book. As, as it goes on, he begins to unpack that, and he, he even describes how we might sort of imagine those in the in the original position sort of be given. You know, uh, the veil is partially raised, and it's partially raised again. And so that, in a way, Rawls has sort of done done what I what I think that, as it were, a good good piece of of, of and responsible piece of, of philosophy on the basis of thinking about thought experiments would would be like. Whereas I think that it's very relatively rare for philosophers themselves to. To, to do that. I mean, so that I think you're completely right that uh, that we can have a sort of vision of labour that there, that there might be, you know, there might be some people like so whether like sort of Francis Cam or, or Jeff McMahon doing these really kind of intricate thought experiments. But then something this, and there might be there might be someone else's job today to say, well, we need to do the the translation bit. My, part of what I wanted to, to 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 point up and at least to get people to reflect on is think was that well, if we think that's how it would work, then well. Who's actually doing that translational research? It, you know, who, who's doing the, the act of translating the, the insights of, of, of Jeff McMahon or, or, or Francis Cam into, into things that are more tractable? And where, where is that process? Whereas in, in the context of translational research, you see there is, there is a pipeline and there's a, there's a way to do this. And in philosophy, we don't have anything like that, apart from possibly in the case of, of Rawls, who's almost sort of done the whole thing him, himself. Thinking about these, the, the, the use of, of thought experiments, I, I was thinking of, of another uh, question in, in relation to well, the former question, or, or because one could respond, to, okay, why can't we just skip these these abstract thought experiments? Um, and I think one argument in response to this is the danger of moral absurdism, um, which, which was my yeah, brings me to my second question. Um, and to the, the last part of chapter four. Because you argue that we uh, cannot investigate abstract moral truths independent from the social reality in which they are used. Um, because in this social reality um, and the, uh, or be, yeah, because this social reality and the use of moral principles in that reality is partly constituted by our understanding of the moral rules. Um, so what privacy means is partly constituted by uh, the way in which we understand our obligations to others and the obligations of others, and similarly an understanding of the social constructs as race and class are key when striving for equality. I hope I explained that correctly. Um, so I, I agree that a contextual understanding is central to the implementation of moral principles. And I also agree that many of the important con con uh, concepts are socially constructed. However, I think it's questionable whether this, I, or the fact that these are, uh, that this understanding is necessary, this contextual understanding, also restricts the role of abstract thinking. Um, so, for example, what we expect from our physicians concerning uh, privacy obligations is important for our understanding uh, the social reality in which a policy is applied. Um, 
but this is less impo uh, informative when we were asking what should be uh, we should be able to expect from our physicians regarding privacy obligation. Um, so primarily focusing on existing obligations and expectations when answering uh, this latter question might cause us to incorrectly accept the status quo as justified. <clears throat> so abstract thinking that is relatively independent from the practice in which it is applied can help to avoid such a bad bias. And I think Singer's challenge upon uh, the argument is, is a good example of this because independent of whether you share his uh, conclusion um, or find the argument compelling, I think that one thing that it achieves to do is that it challenges traditional and common understanding of international uh, justice. So this way of stepping back, back from the complex reality and, and giving, um, showing the, the kind of things that we accept within this social reality is a very uh, important asset of abstract thinking. Um, so with this all in mind, my question is, what do you think about the danger of moral conservatism um, and uh, when starting from real world cases and more from the rest? Mm. But I think it's an excellent question. I mean, I think it's worth sort of reflecting almost what, what we think moral conservatism is what conservatism is and why it's bad. I mean, I think one thing I've been reflecting on over the last year or so is that why did it take philosophers so long to think, to start writing about, say, the, uh, the injustices of, of colonialism? It's, it's a fascinating question that you see that, and it's clearly not sort of as it were kind of white people in Oxford who started writing about these. You have to go to people like sort of C.L.R. James, the, the uh, Trinidadian Marxist, or to Franz Fanon, or, or, or others in the, the negritude movement. You think, well, as it were, it wasn't there as, a, as a word sort of that, that people were feeling, oh, we can only think about real world cases. It's rather that there's a sort of failure of imagination, a failure to realize the ways in which people's uh, could, uh, relatively privileged lives re uh, rested on certain sorts of injustice. Or, or again, someone like, say, um, uh, Um, I, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just leave with that example. So that the, the point being that, as it were, the different sorts of moral conservatism. That um, that if by moral conservatism we mean uh, a failure to to remark on thing, things that are ethically salient, then we can see that uh, well, sometimes it's as it were requires that the philosopher to come in with with a weird thought experiment to do that, but that. That's not a particularly reliable way of, 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 of remarking on injustice. It seems to be much more often that there are people who have experience on the ground who've actually suffered a certain sort of injustice. So again, you know, there'd been uh, quite a long time of sort of, of, of philosophy done by men, many of whom hadn't really thought of kind of injustice towards women as a, as a major feature or something to be discussed. And so that I, I think we have to be careful to, to realize that, as it were, Moral conservatism has many faces, and, and, the, and the, as it were, looking at a concrete cases and not looking at the very sort of abstract cases might be one instance of it. But of, of, you have to, to also look about who has the, who has the voice, who has the ability to, to speak. Um, so, in the case of, of, of what I'm working on in this book, I mean, I think it's worth um, reflecting on almost sort of. Insofar as we're doing the, the, the philosophy of public policy, what sorts of things do we think that governments should be focusing on? And so that, um, insofar as we can get um, more focused on, on things that either are obvious injustices but philosophers haven't theorized them properly, or things that are obvious injustices but for one reason or another people haven't even noticed them. So, I mean, there's a great short article by Amartya Sen just called 100 Mil Million Women Are Missing, where he's drawing people's attention to the obvious fact that there, there are many countries in the world there is as a result of selective abortion or, or neglect sort of uh, you know, uh, female children are much less likely to, to get uh, maturity than the male children, where you realize that there, there may be sort of massive injustices there, which are sort of go relatively unreflected on by, by philosophers, either because they don't know the empirical material or, or they're not they don't say imaginative enough, or they don't affect them personally. So that, um, so I guess first part of my answer just to say, well, almost to push back on the idea of moral conservatism, to think that, well, as it were, that moral conservatism uh, can come with a failure of imagination, and one obvious failure of imagination is lack of, 
one way in which imagination can fail is, is to, to either not have the right experience yourself or to not allow those people who do have the right experience to, to speak. And so I think I would agree with you to an extent about sort of Singer and, and, and his uh, famine affluence and, and morality. I mean, one thing that I always find complicated when, when I, I used to use that in, in teaching quite a lot. And the one thing that really struck me is that it's a great way of starting a conversation, but the, there were was, there was some students who found it difficult to, to move beyond it. They, they sort of got fixated on it, so they wanted to write an essay about, about the analogy or, or, to, or to think of something or imagine there was a second man there in, who could have say, saved the child. And, and, and the whole sort of question about, well, the whole sort of set of questions about external validity and you know, to what extent is this an apt analogy is stuff that I began to try to have that conversation with those students where I found that for some people, they, that, yeah, in a short, in a way, it had sort of upset their moral conservatism, but it, but it, but it had turned into, into a, an abstract thing which is quite different from, from, the, from the kind of complex political problem that really needed to be solved and is really posed by uh, the nature of, of global injustice. Um, so that's quite a long answer. Was this, is, is there anything else that, I, that you want me to talk about which I haven't in, in response to that? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about one thing is, is the role of the ethicist in this case. So um, you mentioned that there are certain very uh, pressing and, and obvious cases of injustice that ethicists don't, just don't give attention to uh, real world cases. And, um, and that makes me think of, of what is the role of ethicists? Because some might say, well, of course those are, are injustices and we should be we should address them, but that's a role for uh, politicians, uh, activists, and, and, and for <coughs> policy makers, or, well, not the role of ethicists. For ethicists, it's to reflect on these more difficult cases where the injustice is not obvious, uh, to figure out what should be done there, basically. To, uh, yeah. Um, Maybe that's just a thought put, to put out there, but what, what, what do you think? Is, is it the role of an ethicist to point out those injustices, or uh, what would you I mean, say to those? No, I think it's a great question. I think the sweet spot for the ethicist is to, is to point out something which, in fact, is an ob obvious injustice, but only becomes obvious because they've pointed it out. <laughs> so, that, so that I think a lot of work, you, th you think you know, what makes a lot of the early sort of feminist work very powerful is that people sort of pointing out a whole set of Assumptions or, or, the, or a set of injustices that, that men, had, you know, that men had, had largely not noticed. I mean, Miranda Fricker has a great sort of um, example about the, almost the, the invention of the concept of sexual harassment. The, 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 as it were, the, a set of beha problematic behaviors have been going on for, for ages, but that nobody has sort of named it and raised consciousness around it. And you realize if you can, can do that and, 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 and create a new kind of framing, people can, can um, interpret their experience in. In new ways, and to do that, and, and, and you you can show that there's been an injustice there all along. I think that's where where theory is at its most powerful. Yeah, I have to say I, I do agree with you that there, if there are cases where you know sometimes an injustice is banned or obvious, you think well, there's nothing I can add as a philosopher other than to say well, this is this is um, this is this is bad. But I think that there there are lots of other cases where you think where where um, Things like sort of systemic injustice, where anybody who suffers from them sort of knows that they're unjust, but to, to sort of articulate you know, the, the nature of the, the causes, the way in which they, they create kind of feedback loops, and to think about what that means for policy, I think that can be useful and, and, and a theoretically uh, powerful work, even, even if the injustice that you're attempting to, to shed light on is, is, a, is one that's obvious to those who experience it. I'll jump in. I have okay. a question on a similar vein. Um, in chapter four, you discuss social realities and how philosophy sometimes mm. has trouble understanding them. And one of the things you say is ethical problems and their solutions exist only in relation to human cultural formations. Mm. And if we consider bottom-up approaches to understanding ethical problems, as you explore later in the chapter, I think some disciplines like sociology or anthropology, critical race studies, political science, I could give a very long list, even yeah. history, might argue they're much better situated to interrogate human cultural formations. I'm wondering what you might say to that critique, and in your own line of research, do you think it's important to delineate the value different disciplines bring to public policy, and what's philosophy's place in that? Do you think it's important to delineate it? Do you think it's an obvious one? I think that's an extremely good question. I mean, I think that a lot of the theorists I find most useful are often people who sort of cross boundaries, so that, you know, 
someone like I don't say you know, the German theorist sort of Hans Joas. He's sort of in theory is a sociologist, but he writes a lot about philosophy. Or someone like Habermas say, well, is he a philosopher? Is he a sociologist? Is he a theorist of media? Maybe he's all or three. Or yeah, you know, I guess maybe in great Canadian philosopher, someone like sort of Charles Taylor. Maybe you know, you know, you know I guess. Yeah, certainly amongst sort of living philosophers, I think that the, there's probably no one I've, I've learned more from. But you think that you know there is a, he's a philosopher. But he writes about the history of ideas. He you know, he's learned about sort of sociology or art or poetry, religion, and so that I think a lot of people do work across boundaries, and that and that maybe there's a question about where your your disciplinary uh, foundations are, where you feel most secure. But I, I think a lot of the time to, to work on problems that really matter, you need to be willing and able to, to cross over those, some of those boundaries. Sometimes that means sort of working t together with people. So you know, certainly in my career, I've done, you know, I've published with an awful lot of people, sometimes with, with, with lawyers or epidemiologists, with, with, with doctors. And, and so that's one way of trying to bring together the insights necessary to, to work on a, a problem that isn't sort of owned purely by philosophy. Um, I should say, I mean, it's something that I know that, that some of my colleagues sort of feel a bit more um, Worried about than, than I do. Whereas I think that, well, you know, I, uh, I guess given the, the nature of the work I, I do, I, I guess I, I describe myself as a, as a philosopher, but I'm not really sure that there's a, a, a special sort of secret source that I have as a philosopher that, that, that kind of critical race theorists or sociologists or anthropologists couldn't have. I mean, sometimes I'm aware that we approach problems in different sorts of ways. And, you know, there, I mean, there, there's certain things that philosophers can do better than other scholars often a lot of the ways that we sort of interrogate the sort of the, the structure of arguments the way we were able to make uh, distinctions the way we're almost able to to think about the theoretical frameworks in quite an abstract way and almost think well, well what are the strengths and weaknesses of a particular sort of, uh, theoretical framework so I think that when, when I do work with others I don't feel that as it were I have nothing to offer as a philosopher <laughs> but at the same time I think that a lot of the time it's, it's things where the, at the centre of my expertise, which might might be closer to the periphery of, of there, so it's more like there's a there's sort of a set of sort of o overlapping uh, competencies rather than mm. rather than the thought that there's something special that that that, that, that only philosophers can do. Because certainly, I don't think there's anything that as it were that only sociologists can do. I mean, they sort of almost like view it. I think it'd be wrong to view it more like a jigsaw where each discipline has its little part and they all fit together in a picture, and there's no overlap once you do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I had a, another question, um, and it was it was on thought experiments because I enjoyed that chapter. It's um, I started in philosophy and then moved to health science, so it was fun being in that world again. But I certainly know as a philosophy undergrad, they're extremely popular tools, oh. and they can be very valuable. But I agree with a lot of your critiques. But I'm curious, considering kind of the critiques you give on high theory approaches and thought experiments in particular. Do you think we're teaching philosophy right, especially when it comes to applied philosophy? I'm wondering, as you were writing your book, if you had any considerations about the way you teach and the way um, your colleagues in the department teach. And I know as a teaching assistant, and I know there's quite a few in the room, um, and I teach in health science, I often have students who are really nervous to get into philosophy. They are worried about appreciating the complexity, when really, at least in the classes I assist for, we're, we're trying to apply it, and that's really the focus. So do you think we need kind of new paradigms for philosophy? Do you think thought experiments have a place in them? And how, you know, you talk about what governments might need to know. But I'm wondering, if we go back a step, how do you translate that to what students trying to learn philosophy would need to know to make those real world connections? Oh, is it another brilliant question. I mean, I mean there's a, I teach a course every year, which is almost, which is sort of quite closely related to this. This book it's, it's called the philosophy politics and economics of, of health and for the last few years for that one for that course that um for the first week i actually sort of focus on something which everybody already has an opinion on people know think they know something about the, the causation and the ethical issues raised by it, which I, we talk about um obesity as a way into it because i quite like that because there's a you know, often you find that people have a kind of strong opinions on it, whether about sort of responsibility or or, or capitalism or about about food and and it, it because you're starting with something that people, as it were, you know, something people talk about anyway, and then you can begin to sort of draw out and, and say, oh, oh, this question about responsibility. How, you know, how do we know what's what's the state's responsibility? What's the individual's responsibility? And then almost think about the 
you know, the role of, of corporations, states, in, in, individuals as a, as a way of starting with a quite a complex problem problem that it, that people already thought about and they're sort of inside. I find that as a, a good way of starting because as a way you you get people uh, thinking philosophically. Um, about a problem they, they, they've already thought about. Mm -hmm. and, and that I found that, I mean, it depends. That some, some people are just kind, of, uh, just kind of brilliant. And so that if, if I was teaching people who are just philosophy students, then I might start with, I might be more inclined to start with theory or, or with, with thought experience. But when a lot of the people I teach on, the, on that particular course, they're, they're people who come from a, uh, maybe either a, a medicine or a health policy background. And so that, and so that um, I found it's it's often not that helpful to try to teach people how to think about quite complex uh, real world ethical issues by giving them a thought experiment because they, they they often get a bit sort of tripped up by it if they're if they're if they're sort of not being philosophically trained so that either they get fixated on the thought experiment or the, or they just don't get the, the thought experiment um, so that you know certainly I don't know whether anybody sort of here as as you know, when you teach applied ethics, you know, something like sort of Judith Jarvis Thompson's paper on abortion, you know, it's a, in some ways it's a very elegant piece of philosophy. But I, I tell you, if you try teaching that with, doc, with, with doctors and nurses or anybody who knows anything about healthcare, then they're a bit sort of baffled by it. And they, they, they don't sort of get it. They find it, they just find it sort of, the, 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 the experiment is so far from their experience that they, that they end up not finding it very, very helpful. And so that I, I, t I do use quite a lot of cases and some of them are, maybe fulfill a, a similar sort of purpose. So, so I, I also teach um, aesthetics and I'm often on the, on the hunt and the lookout for things that might make a good, a good effectively playing the same role as, as that sort of conversation starter or, or, th or thought experiment. But, but, but you know, you, you know, for, for aesthetics, I might take a, a case with Damien Hurst and the, and the shark. And it turned out that when he pickled the shark the first time, he didn't do it very well and it went moldy. And the, then, 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 then the person who bought it was really angry. And then what? What there's, when it happened is they had to catch a new shark, put it in, in some better, better quality for more hives. And we almost start that as a question about was this the same artwork? What would make it the same artwork? You know, just the fact that Damien Hurst says it's the same one and the man who, the man who had the moldy shark agree it's the same art. Was that, is that enough? And so you know, in that case, it's a sort of, it's like the ship of Theseus thought experiment. Apart from it. so it's more fun and also it's a real world example so people can, can can grapple with it, but it's basically I mean playing a similar role to a thought experiment, but it's sort of it's kind of more more concrete, and because it's a real world case, there's a bit more around it, so that you don't have some of those sort of worries about sort of kind of setup or external validity. You know, this is something that literally happened about about ten years ago that you could read about in the in the newspaper. So you can yeah, so it's sort of maybe the best of both worlds, and sometimes I do use cases like that where you can well. So for my teaching this year, I think maybe a case I might use is. Um, no, may have noticed that a month or so ago that the that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that the government in Japan was worried that the about falling tax revenues from from alcohol, and so they actually launched a campaign to try and get pe people drinking more. You know, <laughs> and so always so, so there's a question about the role of the, the, the role and responsibilities of government, just the way the conversation started. I think, well, is this unethical? Oh, no. So, so yeah, I often use it cases of that sort where you sort of similar sort of play the role of a thought experiment, but it's, it's a real world case. Mm. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Okay. Because it makes me think of, of educa moral education in general, uh, and which also kind of asks the question of um, how does this argument apply outside of, of more applied ethics? Because we do tend to teach children with uh, stories, uh, mm. why they shouldn't lie, um, tell them about the boy who cried wolf. There is some, some kind of work for imagination and, and mm. well, Maybe a thought experiment in, in a philosopher's sense, but sort of a thought experiments. Um, so I think that the question is sort of twofold. Do you think this critique would apply as well to, to that kind of education? Um, and to what extent does your argument apply outside of the realm of, of uh, applied ethics? Uh, should we teach well, uh, uh, normative ethics or meta ethics courses as well in, in uh, a different way? Okay, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and separate those two out. And I, I might have to come back to you to ask one of them again if, if I to get halfway through. So that I mean, I think that um, literature or art can be really helpful for philosophical thinking in all sorts of ways. I mean, it's one of the points I try to make in the chapter that that uh, someone like I don't know, sort of Borges, or you can read sort of Greek tragedy or or Proust. There's there's all sorts of things that we can get from from literature, but maybe the off, but most. 
people when you when you read something good that they've they've created a, a kind of world really imaginatively or you think about a good kind of sci-fi book where where the someone's often it, someone's done effectively kind of a really detailed thought experiment but one you can sort of get inside and you can manipulate and it's and it's it's useful because it's different enough from our world that that we can see can enter into it and use that as a vantage point to peer back at, at our at our own world but that often they aren't usually using that in order to, to, to make a, a simple argument. Rather, they've sort of created a kind of world and you can sort of explore. I think, oh, that's weird, that's strange. It allows me to reframe some, some questions or thoughts about this world. And that sometimes, if, um, whether fiction or thought experience, when they, when they do that, I think that, that can be great. Maybe it also comes back to a question about, well, what role does that play in a philosophical argument then? I think my, one of my... The, 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 the worry that sort of set me off on this path was the, the one where often it, it, you can you could quite often read a philosophy paper where where somebody sets up a, a, a quite sort of simple thought experiment and shows that well in this in this instance our intuition is 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 x therefore this has implications you know, much wider implications is is is, is 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 that kind of thing that i i think is problematic or at least that philosophers need to think much more carefully about well how do you know have I lost anything translating from the real world scenario into the thought experiment? And, and how do I know that even if I'm right about what we should judge in the thought experiment, whether it has the implication of the real world case, whereas typically like a science fiction author or, or a novelist doesn't, they, they aren't, they aren't typically trying to, to tell us anything straightforward about what we should do in this world. Then, you know, it's, it's often the power of, of art is it's very kind of ambiguity and, it, and it's, it's ability to hold up a, a world that's quite different, but one which we have to, um, interpret. So I'm a big fan of art, but but just don't sort of confuse art with a with a simple argument. Um, and second part about sort of almost what are the implications for philosophy more broadly? I'm I'm a bit unsure about this. I have to say. I mean, I think that it's partly because I don't read enough, I don't think enough hard enough about lots of other areas of, of philosophy. But it, it does strike me that there's. There's lots of areas, say, like philosophy of mind, where, where you realize that I think a lot of it's kind of riddled with sort of, with sort of dodgy thought experiments. Or you think about sort of the, the massive philosophical literature on kind of zombies, you know, uh, you know in, and the, it's basically the question about, well, you know, is it conceivable there could be someone exactly like you who does everything like you apart from isn't conscious? And, and if, so, if so, what does that show? And, it, and again, I think that it's, it's more difficult to make sense of that thought experiment if you actually are a neuroscientist and you actually know enough about kind of the, 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 the human physiology and, and how our consciousness is, is, is constructed. So it may be in similar sorts of cases that, that philosophers, as we imagine, they can sort of take shortcuts by, by constructing quite a simple example and say, well, see, you can't conceive this, so, so this has widespread metaphysical implications. And the, to the extent that people are using a thought experiment in, in that kind of way, I think it's, it's, it's liable to be uh, subject to the same sort of criticisms I, 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 I use here. I mean, maybe one last thing before, I guess we should probably go to, go to uh, questions and comments at a certain point from the audience, but the, um, um, the main purpose of what I want to argue is to say that, well, thought experiments are often not a very reliable method. And that's not to say that, they, that we should give up on them or, or, that, or that, they, that they can never be useful. It's just that, um, like, think of them like a, a tool, which is sometimes useful, but has its limitations. And so, that, so you almost need to, to be sort of careful when you use a thought experiment to think about well, what, what do I want it to, to do? What's, you know, am I just trying to raise a question for the for the for the for the reader to to think about you know to, to am I trying to start a conversation or am I I trying to I I trying to prove a point and if I'm trying to prove a point am I trying to prove a very narrow point about the specific scenario con I've constructed or am I trying to make a much broader point about about the, about sort of all possible worlds for example and but to the extent that you're trying to make a very broad point I think you need to be able to think through a bit a bit harder about well, why is it that you think that, that that particular thought experiment allows you to to sort of confidently make that very broad claim. And that, that's the thing that I think that often more attention needs to be given to than, than is by philosophers. Thanks very much to all of you. That was a really interesting discussion. Um, I guess I want to hop on to what you said in your very last point. So I completely agree with you that um, thought experiments can be more or less useful depending on what we want to do with them. I guess I'm just not convinced that uh, your claim about what philosophers are generally trying to do with thought experiments is true, but maybe that's just because of the area that I work in. 
So for example, um, I think there are often responses to kind of simplistic reasoning or kind of simplistic principles that we you know, may have. So uh, with regard to say the James Rachel's example that you give. So people often will make the claim, well, killing is always worse than letting die. And the way I see his thought experiment functioning is like, actually, no, I think we need to be careful about that. Um, here's an example where killing is not necessarily worse than letting die. So basically all it's doing there is saying, you know, red flag, let's be cautious about that. Um, so I think they're often more used as kind of cautionary tales or conversation starters as opposed to things that we we think sort of generate principles that we that we can then go forth and apply very broadly in the world. Um, so I'm just wondering what you thought about that. Um, I think certainly to the extent that the thought experiment is, is used in, in a, I guess in, in a more kind of uh, negative and smaller way in that way. So, so if somebody's made a universal claim, you say, well, I can think of one example where that might not hold. It means to refute a general thought. Then I, I think it's uh, then, yeah, I think I'm, I'm much more happy about that. I mean, I, I think in the case of that particular Rachel's paper, I think he does try, I think he does try to make a stronger claim on the basis of the, of the thought experiment. It's certainly my, my, my reading, maybe we could discuss that, that later, but I think, I think, I think uh, it's one of the reasons why I chose that particular paper to, 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 to introduce that. I think he, he does attempt to make that uh, a slightly broader claim on the basis of his single um, thought experiment. I mean, I think there's a, a question, well, I think that you find a variety of, of ways in which thought experiments are used in, 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 the, in the literature. I think that um, there are certainly bits of, of, of philosophy, you know, a lot of stuff on sort of killing and, and letting die or, or population ethics where the literature is almost all sort of kind of thought experiment type things about different variations or repugnant conclusions or other sorts of things or, or even sort of possible impossibility theorems on the basis of, of certain sorts of, of thought experiments. Where, so it may be that it's quite kind of patchy and so that you know, I noticed that you know, it's just as a, uh, a sociological feature that, that you know, a lot of people who, you know, who work in say sort of uh, feminist philosophy or people who work on structural injustice are much less likely to use thought experiments, whereas people who, who often have um, who have sort of underlying ethical views about the nature of moral reality similar to those of, of, of Derek Parfit are much more likely to, to use thought experiments, partly because they think that as what the task is to try and get at uh, ethical principles which are which are correct in all possible worlds, and and that and that if you if you start from that assumption, then it's probably reasonable to think that that as it were only a, a thought experiment of a certain sort might be a useful way of getting at it. Insofar as otherwise, we're going to fall into exactly those sorts of worries about moral conservatism, where we might not have tested our principles broadly and, and widely enough. And so that I think basically I would agree with you that there just seem to be a a continuum, there's a variety of different ways in which thought experiments can and are used in the, in the literature. I, I think that, I don't think the position I was, I was criticizing is a, a straw man position in so far as I, I thought that, you know, that I tried to give a, a variety of examples from, from, from leading philosophers doing the very things that I say they shouldn't be, be doing. So certainly some people are doing the things I'm saying, whether, whether it's, you know, whether it's, whether it's 50% or 75% of philosophers or 10%, but certainly I think it maybe depends from area to area of philosophy. There, there, are, there, are, um, there are areas of philosophy where, where, where I think that the, the majority of the people working are, are doing the sorts of things which I, which I think shouldn't be done. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Michael? I was delighted to uh, hear you uh, quote Thrall's affirmation as somebody who uses uh, thought experiments well. Um, and I was wondering, it made me, it made me think about intuitions, about the world of mm. intuitions. And what's uh, sophisticated in his model is that he brings intuitions from two very different areas and asks us to, to put them in reflective equilibrium. And I wonder if, if there's something about the simplification that you get in uh, thought experiments where you're just using one set of two intuitions, right? You're using a counterexample or you know, something like that uh, as a, a way into something. It's too simple. 
right? And where Rawls works better, I think it does, but it, you know, it's because it's, you've got that sort of broad balancing of intuitions, right? And the thought experiment makes you balance things. And you can come to a different conclusion um, by balancing different ends. Yeah. No, I, I think so. I mean, one thing that's I think is great about what Rawls does is I guess he's sort of so careful of setting out his his um, his working almost to think about so you, all the papers that lead up to a theory of justice were uh, outlined for a theory of, 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 of uh, yeah 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 outlined for disintermediate for ethics. So you realize that he's sort of th beginning to theorize the idea of a considered judgment about how how it would work, and you sort of see that he's theorized almost what he wants an intuition to. To do which which sorts of things are going to count as the sort of intuitions that we should be trying to preserve, then then a whole set of other sort of questions about the relationship be between uh, kind of, uh, knowledge knowledge and sort of self interest and why it is that that uh, the veil of ignorance in asking people to act for their own benefit under a veil of ignorance is a, is a a good sort of analogue for a certain way of thinking about fairness. You can see he's actually been pretty careful about the way he's put, he, he's laid all the pieces on on the table, and, and partly because of that, he puts you in a good position to to understand what assumptions he's he's made. Where you think, well, so there's maybe two two ways of going at that point. You think, well, should, you know, is he right to make these assumptions? And also, if we make these assumptions in in this kind of way, does do we get the conclusion that rules get to? And I, I think it's uh, it's just. Assigned maybe how long it took rules and how carefully it was that we we can you could follow all that that through. Whereas I think that um, in in so much sort of philosophical work where where, where thought experiments are, are used, it seems that as it were these things are very quick. That the that the experiment is is designed is 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 brought in in about half a page and then a conclusion is drawn from it rather than rather than as it were thinking at each element of the design then then going backwards and forwards over it. And so that so I think there's that that kind of that breadth and sort of ecumenical nature of what Rawls is doing—that he's, he's just, I'm just very sort of cautious about what, what he, he he does, and because he's he's cautious in in that way, he's he, he's reflecting with the reader on the sort of mistakes that could come about in this case, and then he's also wanting to, to think through with this about well, how do we sort of minimise the sort of mistakes that we make? So, well, we well, we sort of try to start from judge from ethical judgments that we're confident about, then then try to build in a way of 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 improving our ethical judgments and, and, and putting them into a theory which will, so far as possible, maintain those judgments we're most uh, confident about. And so you realize he sort of thought, thought a lot about almost the epistemology of, of ethics in doing that. So, so his question, well, given that we know that, we're, that some of our views are likely to be wrong, well, how do we, how do we go about doing things in a, in a way that's most likely to preserve the good elements and extend what we have? And that, that's, to me, a, a paradigm of, of responsible ethical Thinking and that I think sort of to the extent that we do that in a, in the use of a thought experiment, then I, I think that can be a, a very useful way of, of of trying to extend the the boundaries of our ethical um, awareness. So that if insofar as you think, well, here here's something I'm I'm confident about, and it seems to have this implication in, in a certain sense. But here here I'm designing a scenario where you, where you can see this, and here's all my working. Here's here's the things that we might be doubtful about it, but it still reaches this conclusion. If, if you want to use the thought experiment that way, I think that's that's kind of it's good. It's it's responsible. It, it, it would be as it were a way of sort of taking the lessons of chapter three. Think well, okay, you know, Wilson has had these worry about thought experiments. How do I design you know, the thought experiments in a responsible way? Given that, so I think it's it's quite possible to to do that. So I'm not against as it were all thought experiments. And I think I'm not against the use of intuition in ethics either, but rather think, think about how you use you know, both thought experiments and, in, and intuitions in a responsible way, which sort of acknowledges that, that uh, there's some likelihood that, that they may give you bad results and, to, and work through how to minimize that, that likelihood. Can I just follow up quickly? Uh, just to get you into health policy. If, if you allow that you can use that kind of methodology, you know, that careful construction, are you restricted to sort of a broad theory, something like Rawls's, or could it have sort of practical applications in health policy, for example? I think you could do it in a, in a narrower focus. I mean, I think that there's a almost Sometimes there's, a, there's a, a question about sort of what do we want a, a theory to do? How 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 general do you want it to to be? Um, so that um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, I'll give a very specific example about something I thought quite a lot about, and uh, something like, well, what should be what should be the principles that should guide sort of the use of, of uh, uh, the, the, what should be the principles that that guide whether or not commercial companies can access patient data in, in the NHS in the UK? So it's a pretty specific question, but you you think about almost sort of what are our settled intuitions here? What do we think that that health system is for? And as it as it happens, the the, the health system in the UK basically has an ethical framework, and in it one that talks about sort of equality and the fact that it has to provide uh, care for everyone on the basis of need. It talked about about scarcity. There's a sort of set of values there that you can see that it makes sense to try to be true to, but then you realize that but you can, you can that's maybe consider your set of uh, considered uh, convictions, but then you're trying to work out what follows from that in this particular domain. And you think, well, there's ways of extending that. Think, well, if we somehow brought, um, sold the, the data to a commercial company and we use it to improve care, in a way that sort of improves, say, health equity, would that be compatible with, the, with these um, principles? And I think it's, it's possible to argue the answer would be yes, but we, we realize that you're, you're doing con attempting to extend a set of, as we're considered judgments about what a health system is for, in a, in a slightly novel context, you, whether to do it, sort of describe it as, that as a, a thought experiment, but basically you're, you're certainly seeing about what are the different ways in which these values can be reconciled in a given context. We're not fully confident about this, let's try this or, or, or that, which, which of these will be the best way of sort of saving our, our intuitions about what the health system is for. So I think you could do something kind of broadly similar using a reflective equilibrium model, starting in the way that rules does with, with our considered judgments. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, a sort of, it's not exactly Rawlsian, but it's a ballpark. Thank you. Uh, thank you for I'm going to take this on. Uh, thank you, James. Um, as you know, I, I didn't uh, have a chance to read your chapters. I didn't look at that um, piece in the on. But anyway, I, I, this discussion is making me just um, wonder how you are, how you're understanding what a thought experiment is. Um, you know, I think there's a certain amount of imagining thing, things otherwise that is inevitable in philosophical thinking. Um, so, you know, how do we distinguish simply um, imagining things otherwise from, you know, and, and thinking up scenarios of how, how things could be or how things ought to be um, from utilizing thought experiments, right? Um, those, I mean, even if we're using real life examples, uh, there's a certain amount of simplification always in the use of examples. And, uh, you know, it's maybe you know, we simplify them in ways that help us to achieve our our outcomes. So, what I just wonder how you how you think about um, the nature of a thought experiment as opposed to the mere use of of examples that um, you know are maybe close to the way things are, but not identical to the way things are. Yeah. No, I think it's a great question. So that. Um, I think I may give a sort of definition of what I'm a rough definition of what I mean by thought experiment in the, in the chapter, but the, not not very much is supposed to, to hang on that. It's not supposed to be an argument about about thought experiments. And you know, when you say, "Well, I've looked at your account of necessary and sufficient conditions for thought experiment," this one doesn't meet that kind of criteria, so therefore your critique doesn't apply to it. I mean, it's supposed to be more the sort of general set of worries about saying, "Well, it looks like in a lot of the work that we do in in, in philosophy that." It requires this this sort of double process of translation that we, we we're trying to sort of almost sort of work out what's really ethically salient about quite so sort of complex situations. So that often a lot of the time, you know, a lot of things are going on at the same time. Try and work out well what's what's the real issue here. So that there needs to be a process for doing that. You can you can. One way of doing that is create a thought experiment, or you know, as you say, a, you know, a case study. Even quite a detailed case study is, is itself a kind of a bit of an abstraction. It's a, it's it's sort of uh, you, you leave out various things just because you know, the, the, the work, real world is is complex. And so that um, I think that um, almost obviously the more the more simple, the more abstract you go, the, the the starker the problem is about well how to almost sort of go from this sort of you know. It's, uh, buzzing, blooming confusion, as William James might have described, into into this sort of stark, simple case. Uh, so that, um, but the, even if you go to a you know quite a detailed case study, that still simplification will be required. And so there's a there's always that second question: think, well, 
okay, we've, we thought quite hard about this, slight, whether slightly or very simplified case. Well, what does that tell us about the, the problem that we started from? So I think that the, the problem's quite a general one about sort of, um, about sort of abstraction and then uh, going back from the abstract to the, to the concrete. And, and so that uh, I, I would... I would suggest that the, insofar as there's a, I have a valid set of, of worries, they would tend to, they might well apply to to, uh, to a case study or, or, or cases or anything, any any other way you want to uh, describe uh, scenarios. But then, sorry, if your problem extends to those, aren't we kind of hamstrung then? I mean, we need, we need to be able to, I think, I mean, yeah. use cases. Yeah. We need to be able to show. I mean, maybe that's particularly true in applied ethics, but as yeah. we both know. But um, I just, think, I just think it's inevitable. Yeah, but no, I, I agree. So, I mean, I guess it maybe needs to say a bit more to articulate what the problem is. I, I, I might take the liberty of reading a bit from from. There. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remember what you said. <laughs> Yeah, some readers have wrongly interpreted this as an argument for abandonment of thought experiments and idealization in, in ethics. Some of these readers have left the defense of thought experiments, arguing that it's not possible to do ethics without considering hypothetical scenarios. This purported defense of thought experiments against my argument misfires. I've not argued against the use of thought experiments too core, but rather for a greater reflexivity in how they're used. Just as the failure of internal validity to, to guarantee external validity does not imply that randomized clinical trials cannot be externally valid, so the failure of internal validity to ensure external validity in thought experiments does not imply that thought experiments cannot be externally valid. In both cases, the relevant question is the extent to which a judgment that appears correct in one context reliably transfers to other contexts. So the thought is that, well, yeah, yeah. Of course, we've got to use we've got to use whether cases or, or thought experiments uh, in in doing ethics. But the, be careful about that. Be ref, be reflexive about the extent to which you think that your uh, your thought about the real world cases is improved by thinking about the abstract case. That, that's maybe the the major okay. yeah. lesson. So it's just a question of a call for kind of responsibility and modesty rather than just saying, well, we can't use thought experiments in. <laughs> okay. Dan, did you have a question? Oh, Dan, 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 Dan. But I'm going to Dan, 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 Dan. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a philosopher. I'm, I'm a computer scientist and a biostatistician, and I teach in our public health program, and I really enjoyed uh, reading your chapter, so thanks, thanks very much. So I, I have a thank you comment, and then I have sort of a goofy question. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to you and the panel for bringing up the issue of interdisciplinarity and, and the real need for it when we're trying to tackle these, these kinds of problems. Um, I'm fortunate actually here at Washington to be supported to be working across disciplines, and it's what we decided about being here. And <laughs> because one of the thought experiments that makes me the most angry is uh, sort of Chinese room argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and I think what you've talked about really crystallized why I hate that so much. Because the setup is completely infeasible in a way that not only is it infeasible in the universe that we live in, it, it cuts a swath across information theory and computer science, you know, 50 years of work that's really identified what, what are the characteristics that make useful, interesting computation possible. It just kind of ignores those and then creates this thing. So, that, and I think that I think that maybe in part that was a failure of a kind of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary lens. And so I, anyway, I just really appreciate the conversation today and kind of making me think more carefully about what that means. So here's my goofy question. So I'm going to push on your, in a positive way, on your analogy between healthcare research and uh, and, and the ethics equivalent. Because I was reading the steps, and I noticed that you skipped over phase one trials. So a phase one trial is where you try to assess the, actually you're talking to, but toxicity or tolerability of a drug, it's a drug trial. And so of course I thought like, yeah, so the analogy would be like, how many, how many trolley problems can you expose a philosophy undergrad to before they switch to health science? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but in a semi-serious way, there's a, there's a question about harm early on in the process. And then also the other the other part that you didn't bring in, which I don't feel like it's missing, but it's post market surveillance. 
So what's happening to these things after they're out in the world? And, and are they doing harm after they sort of escaped? And, uh, and so those are two kind of safety aspects to healthcare research. We're thinking about harms. Um, and I think they're, they're just complementary to the things that you have in, in your analogy here, which are all sort of positive. And I was just kind of wondering if, uh, is there room to think about, I mean, you, you've discussed this, this idea of people wanting to think about being responsible and constructing thought experiments, that makes sense to me. Um, and you've identified, I think, some collections of thought experiments that you find to be deficient, makes sense to me too. Um, kind of got me thinking, like, wow, I wonder if you can sort of trace one or more of these thought experiments to some kind of deleterious policy decision. Maybe that's a little too kind of on the nose, but do you see what I mean? I'm just, I'm interested in this idea of, is anyone tracing the story of maybe specific thought experiments or case studies or whatever, and their way from their inception to maybe actually doing harm if they're not critically appraised on the way? So that's my good question. I think it's a crack good question. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this in the, in the context of, of kind of, What's happened in the effective altruism movement over the last two years? So that, I mean, to kind of cut a long story short, that there's so Peter Singer wrote this this article that we that we've discussed already, sort of famine affluence morality, providing a very sort of powerful argument whether you're a utilitarian or anyone else to say, well, look, well, it's not just a a good act of charity, but rather moral duty, and you're a bad person if you don't give nearly all of your money away uh, just because of the uh, that doing so could prevent other people from coming to, to harm. To, from there to the people setting up the effective altruism move, say, well, if we're giving, then we should make sure we're doing the most good that we can towards. Where that's ended up now is with kind of with long termism, you know. You know, so I mean, I, I don't know if it's playing so big in Canada, but sort of certainly uh, there's a the book that's been getting a lot of press uh, in the UK by William uh, McCaskill, who's a, a philosopher at, at Oxford, making the case for long termism. And basically, long termism is basically the, the idea that uh, what matters above all is is ensuring that the far future is as good as possible. The thought being that, well, you know, if we, if, if we play our cards right and we stop ourselves from annihilating ourselves in the next thousand years, then there could be kind of go trillions upon trillions of, of additional human beings. We could populate the galaxy. And that, that, that prize is so large that we, that, we, that, we, that we need to focus on that above all costs. And, and in, in some um, suggestions, even, you know, that they've even suggested, well, effectively, what, Given, given the prize is so large of things that of, 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 the, of all the good that could be done in the far future, then what we do now doesn't really matter so much. And it had that sense that as were something which started from P Peter Singer's you know quite powerful thought that well it's it's important that you know reflect on whether you know, next time you buy a cappuccino could you have done more good in the world by giving that to Oxfam. We seem to have got to a point where where things were actually. Um, Expanded on that set of, of thought dimension to the point where it's saying, well, no, what matters above all is that we that we do um, we affect what the world will be like in a thousand or ten thousand years time, but we don't do it now. And you realise that that uh, a thought experiment's almost got out of control, you know, and so that so that people have, have carried on following on a particular intuitional way of thinking about things, take it to its logical. Con Conclusion, but now you've got you've got to a point where people like Elon Musk have, have jumped on the bandwagon. Various sort of tech bros who say, "Well, this is exactly what we should be doing," and you know, in, in, to the point where where it's it's a way of looking at the world which seems to, to end up sort of downplaying the importance of, of, of climate change or other sorts of significant difficulties. So that that might be a case of post you know, post market surveillance of anything. Is but I mean, obviously that's a slightly sort of contentious retelling of, of it. But I mean, so I think it would be a, it might be a good ex example case in point. Thank you. David. Thanks. Um, I want to push you further because I have the same concern that Jess had, but um, <clears throat> does that want to push you further on it? I mean, if you make a very general statement that thought experiments can be used bad mm. and they can be done bad, well, that seems obviously wrong. Right. I'm convinced by that. I thought that before reading what you've said. But I do worry that some of the examples you've cited are not in fact good examples. So let me start off with the John Rawls case where you think that's a good case of thought experiment. Of course, one critique of the Rawlsian view is that there are no human beings like those who exist in the original position. Uh, this is a disembodied self. This is a soft self that doesn't represent any kind of reality. And there are people who've really made that criticism and they think they're making a criticism of a thought experiment. Now, I don't think you'd embrace that critique. 
and I don't embrace that critique. Okay. So it's going to depend on whether the thought experiment that you provide is a good uh, illustration of what it is you're trying to, what it is you're trying to prove. So let's take the James Rachel's case for example. So what he's trying to establish is that there's no bare difference between killing and making die. He's not making the claim that there are no instances in which killing is worse than making die. He thinks sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's true that living dies worse than killing. But what he wants to demonstrate is that there's no bare difference. And for that, what he requires is to provide a case in which all other variables are held constant, and the only difference between them is the one is the case of killing and the one is the case of making die. And um, that's what he does in that particular example. Now, it may be that people's intuitions can differ about that case, but to the extent that they don't, uh, there's at least a prima facie case that's been made there that there is no bare difference between getting and getting done. So what I'm suggesting is part of the philosophical methodology when it's done properly is that somebody advances a thought experiment and then there's an evaluation of the merits of that thought experiment. So if we shift now, let's say, to the Peter Singer example of the child drowning in the pond, a lot of the literature that responds to that says, actually, that's not a good analogy for world hunger. And some of those uh, counterexamples that are given are, are misplaced, and there's been a lot of discussion about why those counterexamples are misplaced. Uh, others, I think, are not misplaced. So what you might say is the child riding in the pond is not a very good analogy because we're not dealing with a single person who needs to be saved. I think about a better example where you've got a sea teeming with drowning people, and that lasts not for a day or an afternoon, but it lasts for months and years, and in fact, your entire life. Uh, what is the extent of your duty in a scenario like that? And I think people will come up with a very different kind of conclusion there than they would with a single child in a single pond on a single afternoon. So I think if you examine what the philosophical methodology really is, it's to propose the thought experiment and then for people to evaluate that and see whether it's a good one or that one. Now, do people always get that correct? No, often not. Often they don't identify the weaknesses in the thought experiment. And if what you're doing is calling for that to be done better, then that's great. But when I think the philosophical methodology is used appropriately, it hones in on that thought experiment and says, is this or is this not a good for purpose? Does it or does it not do what it's meant to do? Hmm. So, certainly I, I don't want to deny that, that, that thought experiments can be usefully used. And insofar as you're trying to use them to make a, a, a relatively confined point and you, and you do so judiciously and particularly if if you just want to say well you've made this as a general claim but you haven't thought about this kind of case then I think that's that the ordinary cut and thrust of a of, of philosophical argument I think that's well uh, placed I think the where things get complicated is, is it's always about this question of external validity about what do you think the scope of your claim is is it rather is it effectively say well I can think of a counterexample to your general claim or or is it rather uh, I think that quite a lot of the time people philosophers typically do want to go further than to just to use the the the, the thought experiment to, to create a, a counterexample often it's it's used as a, as a basis for uh, uh, showing a, uh, a point of principle or say well uh, why it is that uh, somebody uses the th Things that you can use the thought experiment to show a particular uh, claim about you know, the, the conditions under which killing is is permissible or or wrong. In that case, um, these concerns about external validity are more likely to come into into play. As if I mean, the the wider the, the the claim that you want to make on the basis of the, of the thought experiment, I think the 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 more reason there is to be, or at least someone to ask somebody, well, why are you so confident about that? What makes you confident that, that as it were, that the, that the, that the thought experiment has, has the wide implications that you do? I mean, I mean one other point in, in response to that, you, you talked about the idea of a bare difference in, 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 in Rachel's. And I think you're, you're right that you, could, you can equalize cases of, of that thought sort, but that one of the, the worries that I, I talk a bit about in the, in the chapter is that, well, yeah, I mean, there's a way of saying, well, other things being equal, there's no difference between this kind of cases. But that uh, if if we're aware that that uh, in the world as we find it, uh, uh, ethical properties tend to kind of interact in holistic ways, then then it's a bit unclear, almost sort of 
what uh, what the how how broad uh, a conclusion we should draw from from the fact that as it were there's no there's in, in a precisely equalized case there's no difference to well uh, what what follows in cases which are which are not different which are, which are which which are not equalized in that way. Well, uh, again, I think there's there's a kind of minimalist claim that can be made here. So James Rachel is responding to a then new policy of the AMA, which is categorically including out of instances of African euthanasia that permitting passive euthanasia. And one basis for that kind of claim is that it's always wrong to actively kill somebody, and it's uh, sometimes permissible to allow them to die. Now, it's a reasonable response to that claim to say, not so fast. There can be some instances where allowing somebody to die is worse than another instance of, of killing. Uh, and I think that's the only claim he's making. And I mean, maybe not everyone's intuitions will go the same way in the case of Smith and Jones. Hope you don't take that case personally, by the way. So you're you're you're, 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 you're to the rest of But um, uh, so people's intuitions could go in different directions there. But if your intuitions do go in the way that he's go, then maybe he's indeed making the point that he wants to make, and not more, nothing more. Hmm. Certainly, if if, if his if what he's trying to do with is 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 just that that limited, then I think I, I probably don't have that much of a problem with that. I think that. Uh, I think certainly that particular article has, has taken on a people have interpreted it in a, in a much broader way within within certain sort of portions of the bioethics literature since then. I'm, you know, I'm aware that people often cite it as as, a, as 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 Rachel's having shown that there's no difference between killing and letting die. It, even if that wasn't his intention, it's 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 uh, it's I, th I think it's quite often taken to be making a broader claim than that. I'd, I'd have to sort of go back to the detail and see whether what what in what if anything in the in, in the article itself would, would okay, allow us no, to... I wouldn't want to hold, hold the author responsible for inappropriate misinterpretations. If you're not sufficiently careful, that's one thing. But uh, if people are reading you in a sloppy way, yeah. the problem lies with them, I think, rather than... No, in, in, indeed. I, I just wasn't sure whether it was a, a sloppy way. I, I thought I might, we might need to go back to the text itself and see, see what are there, are, there, are there things in there which would... Um, Encourage a more expansive reading of what he's trying to do, rather than the very sort of minimalist one. I, I would agree that, insofar as we take the minimalist reading of it, then then what he he does seem to be kind of okay and fairly responsible. Yeah. Um, so this is philosophically interesting. It's a practical question that follows on from from David's question, I think. Scientists have method sections where they need to articulate why they're confident in external validity and the methods they've used to achieve that. Ought we to have that in, in ethics papers? Or ought we to require that um, so that it is explicit, uh, explicitly articulated from the author how they see this having external validity in what ways? I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the things I, I find when I certainly review papers these days, you know, for, for philosophy journals. It, it quite often happens that, that, as it were, somebody wheels in a thought experiment. They're trying to do some work with it. You think, well, well, hang on, that was all quite quick. You know, the, you haven't said very much about the setup or why it is that you you should be confident about that. I, I think it would be really quite helpful for people to. Um, and not just that, but you know, to discuss as it were the methods, the limitations of the, of the methods, what they've given, what we know about the potential um, weaknesses of thought experience, how, how they've just attempted to design it in a way that over, overcome that. I, I think that would be really quite um, helpful. I mean, it is it is kind of weird that why it is that philosophers are usually so reluctant to talk about. Uh, methodology. So I mean, it's I mean, it, because it's not that I mean, I mean it's, it's not that as it were that methodology and philosophy is 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 uncontroversial, or that or that or that philosophers either, we either agree with each other's methods or indeed with each other's conclusions or, or arguments. So it's not like as it were there's no need for it because we all agree. So I think it's just bizarre that philosophers don't have have have, have method sections or don't sort of aren't, aren't more reflexive about the kind of methods that they're using. Well, and to piggyback on those last two comments, uh, how much responsibility the reader has in terms of interpretation, and so I'm a clinician, part of my training is in, in determining external validity for, um, for research methods and before I can apply a study to a, a specific patient situation, um, it, it, there, there are a number of questions that need to be asked as to how relevant that particular randomized control trial is to this particular situation. 
Um, and so whether readers of philosophy articles have a similar responsibility to put, to go through a, set, a process similar to what you're describing in your book, of asking those questions of themselves before then determining any sort of conclusion? I think it's a good question. I mean, I think some things are, uh, um, are hard here because I mean, sometimes philosophers, you know, just feel, oh, I've got a thought here. I want to, I want to get it out and see how people respond to it, and then are surprised when people take it to be a take it as a policy response. I mean, there's a, a classic example. There was a, a paper by a Jubilini and Minerva uh, uh, in the Journal of Medical Ethics, you know, just ca ca called "Afterbirth Abortion," where basically, like, you know, it's. Uh, uh, basically, they were arguing in favour of infanticide in certain circumstances, and, and, and then and then were surprised that people were a bit riled and angry about the paper. And they, they thought, well, we, actually, their, their, their initial response was, well, we're, we, you know, we're, it, was a, it was a philosophy paper we weren't making as a policy suggestion. But the, uh, the kind of responsibility to almost to think about, well, am I making this a policy suggestion? Is, is it just, is it, am, I, am I just playing with concepts? Say, wasn't this an interesting idea? But I think it would it would be kind of helpful for, for readers to, to, you know, to either in the introduction or the or the conclusion, at the very least, to always to reflect on what you think follows from the, from the paper. What are, what are its limitations? And so that always explicitly talk a little bit about well, wh why it is that things might be more complicated in the world, and even if even if your your argument is is a is a valid one that that uh, people might not want to act on it, you know, unless they've really thought very hard about it. So that yeah, I think that it's it's it's, it's odd how often philosophers in the past have almost have been tripped up by that. They think, well I was you know I, I, was, I was just doing <laughs> just doing philosophy rather than yeah. yeah. Just ten second follow up on Max's comment is that the scientific papers also have limitation sections mm -hmm. well, yeah. explicitly. Yeah. Okay, excellent. That was uh, lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, so please join me in uh, thanking our panelists. Dean of faculty, yeah, yeah. drop by Thanks, guys. for oh, fun, you, and, you know. Like, I'm a sometime philosopher, so it's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. 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 I have to move off to an event, but uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you. See you. See you. I wish I had read the paper before. <laughs> I'm Eric. Hi, oh, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go for dinner. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, tomorrow's talk is going to be uh, about the book, uh, like the, the other part of the book that you have. It's sort of, it's basically sort of using some of the ideas from, it's sort of, sort of what I've been talking about in two years since then. So it's sort of, it's about getting a problem that's allocated. Yeah. 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 Yeah.